gives you an idea, you know, what food is. Many speak uh, of food as medicine, for example. Steiner spoke about food as the actual thing that develops your, well, shall we say, um, will forces, you know, your ability um, to develop consciousness, even he went that far. Some of the crazy stuff he said, but you know, it's, I think science will uh, sooner or later even get to these kinds of things, that food is way more than just a, a sort of um, a way to, um, you know, a delivery system of calories, shall we say. <laughs> Sebastian Kretschmer is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. As an organic agriculturist, educator for sustainable development and food systems expert, Sebastian is committed to help build regenerative food sheds, food sheds and equitable value chains for maximum SDG performance. As a biodynamic farmer, lecturer, and advisor to corporations and international aid organizations, Sebastian has designed and implemented programs aimed at fostering food sovereignty and to grow the next generation of organic farmers. Projects from 2004 to 2018 include the Northeast Mentor Network and Biodynamic Apprentice Program, with the New England Small Farm Institute, his community supported agriculture farm at Camp Hill Village in Pennsylvania, the ethical rainforest supply chain project with Estee Lauder, engaging with indigenous communities in Brazil and Honduras, as well as the organic orchard prison inmate reentry program with the city of Philadelphia and Temple University. Throughout the last few years, as founding member of the Organic Food System Program and the UN One Planet Network, Sebastian used his recently completed PhD project at the University of Kassel, Germany, to develop essential variables for food systems trans transition pathways. A central focus of his work is to leverage the capacity of farmers and food processors through the formation of food hubs, which Sebastian believes can drive the mecha me mechanics of public procurement, as well as B2C and B2B value chain within territorial food systems. As a global citizen, Sebastian is passionate about big ideas, deep sustainability, and a systems approach for everything. Sebastian, welcome to the show. It's so good to see you. I see you nodding there. Uh, uh, did I leave anything out? You've been doing this for a while, so I'm sure there's a lot more I could add. Well, hello, Mark, and thanks for having me on your show. Um, well, you know, I've always uh, been faithful to the discipline of sustainable agriculture, from being a farm apprentice to then a journeyman and then, um, you know, studying at um, college, organic agriculture, and then going back to farming, um, to being a consultant, to being a, an educator, um, to being um, a bit of an agripreneur, perhaps. It's a lovely word. Um, not sure if I uh, exactly fulfill that criterion, but uh, I'd like to consider myself an agriculturalist. And now through my academic studies, I've really gotten into the SDGs and what organic agriculture can do um, to accomplish that agenda. So um, I'm sort of a one trick pony when it comes to my professional life. I've been an organic agriculture specialist, but I've explored many disciplines within. And so I'm proud to say that um, from being a farmer to now soon holding a PhD in agriculture, um, that's my, my deep, deep passion. I love it. And I love agripreneur. I think that's a, that's a great, great word as well. So it's so true. And we'll get into more kind of the uh, small hold farms, community farms, community food webs and things into our discussion. But I'd like to start out first and foremost. So during this time of almost two years now of craziness, you know, pandemics and 
Black Lives Matters, a lot of food issues, a crazy inauguration, Asian racism, and even in Germany, a lot of flooding going on to climate change and, and affecting agriculture and infrastructure in many different ways where our, our um, earth is just not able to absorb, uh, our soils are not able to absorb the amount of water that they're seeing and the uh, kind of infrastructures we've, we force them to be. I wanna know, honestly, are you and your wife okay? How, how have you weathered this, this craziness time, this storm? But also in this journey, uh, finishing up your PhD and, and what you've been doing for a long time as an organic farmer, um, how have you weathered and has any of it proven to be kind of a better model for resilience or a better way of life or one that kind of helps you get through crazy times like we've experienced? Mm. That's a nice question. And I know you ask these questions your guests, which I uh, think is beautiful because then you get real sort of comparability between different uh, people's perspectives. Um, well, you know, um, the earth is holding up a mirror, you know, and um, it's um, been sort of clear uh, for many, you know, how dire the situation uh, was and, um, and, and has been, and <clears throat> it's um, this kind of um, emergence that you could um, now detect in uh, the kind of consciousness that ha has been there for, for a long, long time, you know, about the suffering, uh, both socially in, in the social sphere of our global community, um, because the environmental crisis that um, began to sort of reveal itself beginning in the 70s um, has been correctly labeled as a social crisis, really, you know, how we relate to each other. Um, and it's so, um, you know, in a way it's, um, you could almost say, well, we told you so, <laughs> you know, um, but you know, that doesn't help. I mean, it's um, just an emergent consciousness that is gaining uh, a lot of momentum now. And unfortunately, you know, most folks are sort of reactive rather than proactive, shall we say. And now that the earth uh, is sort of forcing us almost, you know, to smell the coffee and, and to, to wake up Many of us have um, been, well, intrinsically motivated, you know, to, to realize these things, the suffering that's been going on on our planetary health uh, and ecosystem health, but also in the social sphere. Um, and so it's kind of heartwarming to see that a lot of the knowledge that had been generated already through the ages, I mean, a lot of the knowledge and wisdom from the mystics, um, you know, the Eastern philosophies, many of these things are now uh, beginning to take on a whole different meaning. Now that science has, you know, finally come around to actually um, regard common sense also as a sort of uh, important um, normative agenda since the SDGs especially you know, indigenous knowledge and other forms of local knowledge are being taken a little bit more serious. You know, uh, there is a transition from this very reductionist thinking to a more sort of systems um, approach. And likewise with all the movements that you've mentioned, you know, people are um, gaining more and more sensitivity um for the feedback you know that sometimes just spans generations if you think of black lives matter you know the the deeply entrenched suffering um and in all the sort of um negative synergies that have arisen from that you know and that have uh, built these sort of macro regimes um of injustice you know, that are based on sort of, you know, um, feedback loops, exactly feedback loops, 
uh, but feedback loops with negative externalities. There are also feedback loops with positive externalities. Oh, yes, very, yeah. And so um, this kind of consciousness that is emerging is, is deeply heartwarming for me. And, um, you know, luckily, I haven't really been so phased by the corona pandemic simply because I've been in my, you know, beloved uh, university here in Germany. I live a stone cast, a cat's leap away. I can walk here by foot. I get here at seven in the morning. I get out of here by seven at night. And, um, you know, we've been rather unfazed by, you know, let's say the corona pandemic. Uh, we're vaccinated and everything. But the fact that I don't know a lot of people that have, you know, uh, contracted the disease is sort of um, also testimony, perhaps, that uh, I may not be connected to um, so many people that are maybe not as fortunate as I, because as we all know, on a systemic level, it hits also predominantly folks that are not as privileged, you know. And so to say that I don't know anybody or not many people that haven't gotten this is sort of like not, you know, a great, I mean, sure, I know some people for sure also, but, um, you know, the kind of compassion that is needed now also to feel the solidarity um, with folks that are not as privileged, you know, and I count myself as privileged, even though I'm not earning a lot of money as a scientist. I mean, you know, it's not exactly a, a white collar salary. Well, yeah. again, it should count as a white collar salary, but still, um, no, I feel um, blessed and, you know, luckily I've had plenty to do in my academic work to just kind of, um, you know, wait it out. And I've been lucky enough to, to be productive in this time. That's great. I, I mean, my daughter, uh, my oldest daughter went to the Goethe Institute in Castle. So I know exactly how beautiful it is there. I've been there before. She had a wonderful time. But I also know what the, the the microcosmos looks like in Castle, and so you you are very fortunate. And not only is that a, a great university, but a great place to be. And and there's something to be said with that. Uh, our health is really a microcosmos of the world around us. So if the world around you is doing pretty good as far as education and basic resources and farming and and environment, clean air great trees, nice forests, things like that, that uh, um, kind of create this nice microcosmos around you. Um, it's really a reflection on, on health as well. Um, I, I'm in Hamburg, Germany, so it's a big harbor town. So a lot of ships, a lot of pollution, a lot of uh, emissions in the air, a lot of bad air. Um, it's also a green city, but it's it's much different. It's much more densely populated. And so it's a whole different microcosmos. It's a lot easier to, to spread things. Uh, and it's also tied to how healthy the air and environment is around us. Um, we're all on the same planet. So there's really no no place to hide from, from climate change or bad air. We're all going to breathe the same air uh, eventually and drink the same waters eventually. I mean, I, I, I probably to a degree have breathed the same air that Gandhi breathed or, you know, um, uh, whoever the other great is that I, that I would consider out there. I, I also like the fact that, you, and, but I'm going to hold your feet to the fire a little bit. The fact that um, you you really tie that to this consciousness, and uh, you and I are both biodynamic, organic farmers, so uh, certified, and been doing it for a while. Um, I don't know if you. This is a kind of a, a replica book, but it's Agriculture by Rudolf Steiner. It's really the biodynamic bible, uh, so to say, almost. But um, I wanted to see if you because you mentioned consciousness and you also mentioned agriculture and, and, and kind of how you see this world around you and, and, and the basics, he was pretty esoteric. He was pretty big on consciousness and spirituality and, and different views on, on nature and the world and things as well, which can scare a lot of people. A lot of people say, well, that's, you know, 
tree hugger. It's a uh, esoteric. It's that's something that's out there that doesn't have a lot to do with science. Um, so one, I don't want to jump off tangent too much, but it kind of ties into to some things and I would love to see your view. And then I, I really want to also hold your feet to the fire. Maybe you could say one way or the other has kind of, since you've been even in the United States, that's where you're originally from and then you're living in Europe and maybe kind of your, your historical ties to how you've come to where you are today, but has any of that helped to kind of say, oh, I have this different lifestyle that I live or I chose and how I interact with my mm -hmm. microcosmos and my world. And then actually in times of pandemics and times of hard times, mm -hmm. it gives you a little resilience or it gives you some other bills or say it's, it was awful. You know, I was, I was miserable. I felt like I was in prison or, you know, I, that's kind of, I'm kind of wondering if, if you noticed any difference from kind of before and after or during type of situations, if there's a new model in there, if there's a new kind of that new consciousness model to live? Mm -hmm. Well, I've um, trained in biodynamics. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, I've had some mentors that <laughs> even knew Steiner still. Um, um, <laughs> It did uh, inspire me, and um, I have to say, Steiner's um, Anthroposophy, the science of um, you know humankind, translated, <clears throat> is uh, sort of far out, you know. And so here at the university, we're um, very, very carefully uh, taking some of his hypotheses. And we've actually worked with uh, a number of them in a very fruitful manner. Um, you can tell the uh, value uh, of a movement by way uh, of how it becomes a self-starter, you know, what it actually inspires. Think of the whole Waldorf School movement that Steiner, you know, started. Yeah. Fabulous. You know, there are many analysts that are saying there should be a Waldorfization of the school system right now because it's a very, very valuable approach to schooling. Um, think of, um, you know, uh, Steiner's whole um, sort of um, health impulses that inspired, you know, uh, an anthroposophical sort of medicine track and, and some very successful uh, companies um, that have advanced uh, homeopathy, uh, you know, in, in, in the most effective ways. Uh, think of some of his macroeconomic uh, theories that he advanced, you know, that have become the basis for many sort of commoning approaches uh, and the sort of what we call the um, commoning uh, kind of economy based on, you know, um, global commons uh, and, and everybody's welfare. And so Steiner, to me, um, you know, has been uh, a big source of inspiration as an agriculturalist. And still worldwide, you can see um, how it has borne fruits, think in viticulture, you know, in the wine growing. Uh, regions of the world, how uh, many vintners uh, or, you know, uh, viticulturalists have adopted some of the biodynamic measures without making a big deal out of it, you know, just because it works, you know, it's powerful stuff. And so it's hard to really um, empirically measure some of those things. But uh, just to name maybe an example, um, looking at some of the uh, soil biome uh, affected by these biodynamic preparations uh, <clears throat> and a sort of biodynamic farming uh, regime uh, have shown some very promising uh, patterns of uh, sort of effective microbes and clay humus complexes arranging themselves uh, with beneficial microorganisms. And there are these sort of picture forming methods now to show uh, the effects 
of, uh, of, uh, of, of these techniques. Likewise, in the food space, uh, Steiner inspired this technique. It's called copper chloride crystallization. Uh, initially uh, designed to detect uh, cancer cells in blood. So crazy breakthrough uh, technique. Uh, copper chloride is a metal salt, you know, and if you add small samples of, let's say, plant juices, even in, in the food space, as I mentioned, it's been used. And then with some distilled water, um, this copper chloride always crystallizes out on a petri dish when the water evaporates. And it always leaves a very distinct crystal structure just by itself. But if you use some small uh, samples, you know, like um, wheat or carrot juice, let's say, or even milk, you know, then you, you get a very sample specific crystal picture. And so I was involved with it actually when I did my master's thesis in 2004, we developed like a scientific method around how to use uh, the visual evaluation of these copper chloride uh, crystal pictures. And so then we compared, you know, how does it differ now when you have conventional wheat or carrot uh, juice uh, added to this copper chloride salt as opposed to organic and biodynamic. And the differences are striking and are actually statistically relevant. There are publications on this uh, peer reviewed. And um, so the uh, crystal images from uh, the uh, samples, from the organic samples, uh, when you assess them according to this sort of nomenclature that we developed, you know, these descriptors that remind you almost of a botanical type of description because the crystal pictures have these needles and these side needles, and they either are very center coordinated and they ray out to the periphery or they kind of are stunted and they stop spreading. They say something about the vitality of the uh, plant, you know? And so just that alone is an indication that there is a sort of inner order to food. And while this uh, may be considered a luxury problem because the foremost priority of course must be to feed people, you know, healthy food and it doesn't necessarily have to be organic. It should be sustainable. It should be mostly plant-based, but still it it gives you an idea, you know, what food is. Many speak uh, of food as medicine, for example. Steiner spoke about food as the actual thing that develops your, well, shall we say, um, will forces, you know, your ability um, to develop consciousness, even he went that far. Some of the crazy stuff he said, but you know, it's, I think science will uh, sooner or later even get to these kinds of things, that food is way more than just a, a sort of um, a way to, um, you know, a delivery system of calories, shall we say. So the anthroposophy and the biodynamic agriculture is the perfect sort of fusion of on the one hand, an enlightened agricultural model that developed notions such as the farm organism, how to calibrate the land base to the amount of livestock. You know, these ideas of deep ecology uh, have been radical at the time. You know, the idea of uh, agriculture being a highly sort of local affair, you know, close nutrient cycles. These are notions that Steiner has advanced. But the fusion on the one side uh, between this and also the sort of idea that we are on an evolutionary journey and that there is a sort of trajectory, there is a sort of hidden driver there uh, in the evolution of consciousness and the sort of idea of school of life. It was Steiner's ambition really to sensitize people about the idea of an evolution of consciousness that we can actively engage with. And so to me, that was really a deep, deep uh, awakening. And it has, you know, sort of shaped my life in, in many ways. And I've met amazing people, you know, that are um, really working in the most, productive, undogmatic ways with, um, with this anthroposophy and biodynamic farming. So what can I say? It, it, it's a huge success. And it's really something that, that uh, 
works, there, there are some things that we'll touch upon as we go further as far as regenerative organics. And if that's a, you know, it's, it's a, a step further, or if it's another layer to the onion, so to say, if it's mm -hmm. another, another dimension that we open up and, and uh, what that looks like uh, mixed with, you know, agroforestry, permaculture, that different, different uh, practices out there of which I believe we both have, have many experiences and touch points with as well. I'm going to still hold your feet to the fire now. Per, on a personal note, during that, I want, uh, you know, whether you take it to 14, 16, 18 months, two years period of time um, that, that we've had, so there's some crazy things going on. Has there been any learning lessons? Has there been anything where you say, boy, I'm very, I'm, I'm very fortunate and blessed to have this type of thinking like you know, uh, biodynamic, organic agriculture, um, uh, to think in, in many ways, like some of these greats that, that have been out there, because they're almost better models, not only to connect humanity, but connect us with our basic energy source. And I just mm. want to know if, you know, if there's, you, you do not need to get personal if you don't want to, but I just want to know, I mean, um, I've heard stories, uh, and I'll give you some examples. I've heard stories from <clears throat> Some of my guests and, and friends have been on the show who, who've really said, boy, I used to speak about this all the time and talk about the future. And then it came and I wasn't prepared and I'm struggling and it, it was hard. And then others said, no, I've been, I actually applied what I spoke about and what I taught into my life. And it, it was a lifestyle almost. And um, I was able to, I was able to weather it pretty good. Whereas my neighbors were running to buy the last thing of toilet paper or struggling for food or, or arguing or fighting at home or whatever it was because it was a really hard time for them. Their lifestyle wasn't conducive. They were used to, to others providing this sustenance or basic needs or infrastructure to them. But I kind of had that, you know, and so I'm just wondering if there was any aha moments, learning lessons or, or anything that bubbled to the surface or you kind of in reflection, mm -hmm. whether you're reflecting right now when I ask you the question, mm -hmm. if there was anything like that for you, if, if not, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> I have to say, honestly, that um, it didn't come as a surprise to me, you know, as um I've always been um, acutely aware of the suffering in the uh, in the ecosystem and in the world. Um, as a consultant, I've um, I was able to travel the world quite a bit, uh, working with aid organizations and also a Nobel Peace Laureate Kalash Satyarthi in in India. Um, helping to get these kids out of the mica mines and in Haiti after the uh, earthquake, trying to, you know, connect local citrus farmers to uh, some global markets or be it in Honduras working in indigenous territories or, or in the Amazon. I've seen the suffering also in Liberia just six months before the Ebola outbreak, you know, having traveled in, in Monrovia and some of the poorest um, parts of the world. And so I've been acutely aware of the suffering and the sort of driver trajectory of the current driver patterns and where that is headed inevitably because of the sort of misaligned capital basis you know the natural capital and the social capital are just not aligned and we've been tripping on the wrong paradigms uh, one has to say it as bluntly as that there have been grave errors in understanding um, you know the sort of uh, image of humankind and our role on this planet it has been grossly misinterpreted and it was completely inevitable um, that these things um, were going to happen. When you look at the, just at the, the biome, you know, that comes about in this sort of um, 
um, you know, very uh, nasty kind of uh, chaos that comes about in, shall we just maybe mention the food system space. There is a real difference, you know, between the sort of um, lovely sort of uh, chaos uh, on an organic farm where there is a multitude of uh, microorganisms uh, where there are plenty of sort of antagonistic forces that keep things in check, you know, through the diversity in the soil. And uh, that is of course, then also expressed on the sort of um, the, the, the surfaces of, of, the, of the fruits we harvest and in the spaces around the farmstead. There's a big difference between that kind of lovely chaos and the nasty sort of disorder that comes about when you deal with uh, substances uh, such as pesticides and other synthetic uh, inputs and the kinds of uh, negative synergies that sort of spin out of control when you have these misaligned uh, capital basis. And the biome uh, in the world was uh, inevitably going to lead to the spread of such viruses because there aren't the kinds of antagonistic forces that keep things in check. And you can take this as a metaphor uh, even into our own sort of inner life. You know, we're sort of in a way uh, governed uh, by, you know, um, narratives uh, and norms that don't exactly align, that don't create that sense of coherence. Um, you know, there is a beautiful theory, it's actually called the sense of coherence, when life is uh, comprehensible, manageable, and meaningful. That's when people derive a sense of coherence in life. That's when things are aligned. When that mindset is there, then all the sort of um, manifestations, you know, everything around us that we see is just a manifestation of the mindset that built it, right? And so when I look at this world, it was clear to me that these disasters were going to strike. And so to me, it didn't come as a surprise. But what I find <clears throat> most beautiful now is that people finally, even though it comes as a sort of outside reminder and it is not necessarily always a proactive, intrinsic sort of drive, but it doesn't really matter which way it works, you know, if it comes as an extrinsic uh, pressure, uh, that people now have um, the ability to actually ponder in these things. You know, it was never really a topic, almost a taboo, you know, to talk about mindset and the things that drive us and whether maybe certain things are um, a bit misleading, you know, this kind of moral nihilism almost, you know, the idea that just everything is valid, there is like seven billion truths out there. Um, I don't think so. You know, there are certain, um, you know, moral truths, and that is uh, expressed in this SDG framework, which is a beautiful uh, sort of normative horizon, and there is a, an innate compatibility uh, ethically speaking, between this, you know, these goals that create a utopian vision, really, um, there is now an opportunity to ponder in these things and give people, uh, you know, justification <clears throat> to speak out. You know, uh, things are much more possible now. I see that in the research space, the kinds of things that are being published are like uh, sometimes quite radical, you know, and I salute that. I think it's beautiful. I think it's necessary to move away from this reductionist to a more holistic thinking. And so uh, while it hasn't been a surprise to me and while I was in a way quite prepared, um, I think it's beautiful that, you know, even like my parents now, you know, are telling me on the phone, they say, Sebastian, we see how everything is just sort of going to hell. You know, we're buying organic food now. Thank you for always telling us this. And we've never really realized how important this is, you know. So I see there is a huge shift happening right now. That's so beautiful to hear. 
My listeners don't know this, but we're going to tell them um, you are contributing a most wonderful piece in, in a book uh, that I'm doing. It's called Menu B. It's a collaboration with about 46 other authors, scientists, doctors, foodies, uh, chefs from around the world, farmers, agriculturists. Um, it is a beautiful work, and you have submitted um, the organic mindset, uh, accelerating uh, this, this shift towards uh, sustainable food systems, and it is a beautiful piece. It is um, right up there in, in alignment. You know, we have contributors like Alan Savory and Carolyn Steele and Fritz Holf Capra and um, many, many other fabulous greats uh, in, in the space. Mark Shepard, who's restoration agriculturist and, and uh, farmer himself, just fabulous people in there who are well-written, well-spoken, and are activists. They're environmentalists. They're active in the space. They're actually doing the work. They've done it for years. They've practiced it. They've, they've grown food. They know how, how food grows and, and why it's such an important thing. It's not just someone who has only studied at that. And you, you're the same way. So you, you actually started out with an apprenticeship and then got your journeyman and, and went into the space food space. You've been involved in numerous projects around the world in food. And so uh, it's an, a sheer honor to have you as part of the con contribution. But um, in some respects, we want to tease a little bit uh, with this podcast. And I think you brought some slides with you. And I don't know if, if this is the right time that you would like to kind of tease and talk to us about this uh, your thoughts and philosophies uh, uh, on this, and maybe even a little bit of what you wrote, if that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. Don't tease it too much. We don't want to give away the, the book, but um, because I really believe that the way you tie the SDGs and the way you do it is fabulous. But I, I give you the screen if you want like to share some slides and maybe tell us a little story about uh, what you contributed and what, what you've been working on and what your thoughts and feelings are. And I and I hope I'm 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 precursing this right because a lot of people, how are the SDGs connected to organic? How are the SDGs tied to food? And I've I've been talking about that since 2015, actually, right before they came out. You know, uh, uh, Johan Rockstrom and many others in the food space were actually presenting a different form of SDGs. So they're all tied to food. They're basic the the basic resources of life, the biome, the biosphere, the that's all tied to food and it's tied to the SDGs. And so I'd love to hear from you now and maybe you can uh, show our listeners for some of those on the audio, you can go later and download uh, the, the uh, PDF and, and view the video one. But uh, for those who are watching the video, they get a little extra treat if you could maybe visually describe as well what we're seeing or uh, audible describe it so that they can get a picture of what you're showing as well, that would be nice. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, it really tickles me to speak with people who um, who have such a um, compassion for this um, sort of sacred knowledge, really. Um, and um, what you do also is so important as an aggregator to bring all these voices uh, to the fore. I mean, I'm following your stuff and um, I'm... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really thankful for the work that you do, Mark, and I'm, I'm thankful that you give me the opportunity to speak about my work a bit. So um, I've been interested in um, drivers in food systems. It's a very elusive term, the way it's been treated in, in the scientific literature. It's just kind of talking about the well, these general arenas like technology, uh, you know, and um, things like um, global warming, climate change, um, you know, just these sort of general spaces out of which trends um, arise that are somehow shaping um, the way um, the food system works. And to me, it's been a very unsatisfactory 
kind of an answer to this driver question. I wanted to dig deeper. And um, <clears throat> when I uh, ask myself and my team here and uh, the organic uh, food system uh, community that is part of this beautiful program out of the UN One Planet Network, you know, what drives the uh, organic food system or sustainable food system community? You know, is it sort of driven by these same trends that many food system actors feel like they just have to respond to? Or are there maybe other drivers, you know? And soon came to the realization that um, there is a fundamental difference. And um, the way that uh, folks in the sustainable ag space, and I mean the more deep sustainability ag space, we all know how that word sustainability has gotten a bit deflated, shall we say, or inflated. Um, there uh, seems to be uh, a difference in the way actors respond to these same big trends. Um, you know, many in the conventional agriculture space, um, they are caught in these path dependencies. You know, one has to really uh, also understand this with some compassion. Think of a, 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 a pork producer that just invested in like a, a huge, you know, pig barn for, you know, like um, a thousand animals or more. Um, and, you know, invested a uh, million dollars in, in that regime uh, potentially you know funded and financed through some other corporation who will then market the the produce or or the the meat in that in that matter um, this farmer isn't gonna so easily just switch to a regenerative practice because she or uh, he just invested a ton of money and is kind of locked in now for the next 15 years at least. And so I've had, you know, some really um, amazing conversations with friends in the conventional ag space, you know, one has to understand that it's not always so easy and one cannot just say, oh, you guys ought to just change, you know? Um, but the uh, um, sustainable and organic regenerative community um, often seems to go about it in a, well, in a sort of more independent manner, often not being the driven ones, but actually driving something from their own sort of intrinsic conviction. And that is also due to the fact that there are a lot of first generation organic farmers. Most organic farmers have some sort of a degree they don't necessarily come from, you know, uh, generations of agriculture you have, <laughs> which I find amazing. I'm lucky. Mm -hmm. I'm a first generation farmer too, you know, my family has nothing to do with agriculture, even though some crazy distant uncle of mine in the 60s drove a tractor from Hamburg all the way to Tuscany and started an herb and goat farm. <laughs> it's like, okay, there's got to have been some genes there. But anyway, so what I found was that there is uh, an actual mindset there, a real pattern. So we've looked at, you know, food systems around the world, and I'm talking global South uh, and some European countries, including also the US, over 240 interviews with food system actors in that space. And we found this incredible pattern and it was so beautiful just to see, you know, what drives these actors. And if I may, I could just show. Um, Please do. Yes. A little slide here. And that is um, it starts out kind of uh, building from uh, just this basis here. So I figured, OK, there's got to be a way to portray um, the kind of food system mindset that we need um, from not just this driver perspective in terms of already 
uh, you know, existing manifestations of a mindset that produce these things, but starting, you know, with the sort of original instance that actually creates the manifestations in the first place. So I went back to the very mindset that creates the world that we live in. And for that matter, our food systems, which you see on the left-hand side is a sort of um, paradigm scale, the sort of ego-centric uh, or anthropocentric mindset. It's the dominant social paradigm. You know, humankind is the crown of creation and we are at the heart of this creation and uh, nature uh, is only of value to us when it delivers us economic benefits. That's the sort of neoliberal dominant social paradigm, the anthropocentric or egocentric mindset. And uh, on the top, you see the ecocentric mindset is the opposite, really. It's sort of when you look at us human beings as just one part of this creation of this world we live in and that um, nature must always have a place at the table in a sort of inclusive governance uh, setting there's got to be uh, the consideration you know as has been already intended in the uh, earth charter and various sort of un protocols this is nothing new this has been around since the 60s or 70s um, and as I said, there is this sort of emergence now of these values and these insights of, of being uh, of, of fundamental value as we go toward the future. And I've just tried to portray this uh, in terms of this sort of equalizer model here. So my theory is that SDG drivers, the sustainable development goal drivers, they emerge on this paradigm scale of certain essential uh, variables or leverage points. And these things that you see here, agrobiodiversity, food system education, production system, food system governance, consumption, value chain, ecosystem services, these are the important leverage points um, that we need to engage with in a way that promotes um, you know, favorable outcomes, because we live in a world uh, that produces outcomes that nobody wants, you know, the kinds of social inequities, the kinds of uh, ecosystem degradation that's going on, these are just outcomes of many distributed synergies from driving forces that stem from mindset, you know, that produce these negative externalities. And I believe we must think of biodiversity, agrobiodiversity in a more sovereign way. Think of the Via Campesina, you know, producing more diverse food in one region, localization. Many of your speakers uh, speak about localization um, of food, you know, the re-diversification of agriculture transformation in the education, be that in schools uh, where kids ought to really learn from an early age, you know, what uh, ecology, sustainability, transformation means, how personal health is connected with ecosystem health. Nobody can tell me that sustainability is an elitist thing. Uh, it is the most equitable thing there is. And unfortunately, it has become this kind of elitist thing, which is uh, really a shame because it's the most empowering thing to everybody. If people were only sensitized about this from an earlier age and not brainwashed and conditioned by this sort of neoliberal mindset, that is expressed in so many different ways. It's the hidden driver, the ontology that is just hidden everywhere. So transformative education, resilient production systems, of course we need agroecological approaches. Of course, we need to have regenerative farming systems. It is <laughs> so clear and it's becoming more and more scientifically evident. The governance, uh, think of beautiful, uh, you know, um, food policy 
uh, you know, networks, uh, councils, all sorts of collective impact food alliances. This is where it's heading. We can't have these fragmented, siloed uh, governance uh, regimes where uh, food, you know, is uh, not really talked about as the great convener, but rather as just some thing, you know, that happens through a completely globalized uh, supply chain. Um, so uh, food system governance needs to be thought uh, in an inclusive manner. This rural urban nexus is the key word here. Um, but also consumption levels, you know, have to be a bit more moderate, you know, we have to find joy in moderation. It's not this thing where we have to refrain uh, from something and it's this great loss, how they always talk about in German politics, you know, it's so tiring to always hear the same narrative when it comes to, hey, maybe we could actually, um, you know, gain some spiritual insights we can maybe have happier lives and maybe we can have deeper emotional insights, more compassion, more joy about the simple things in life, you know, that comes about through moderation. And uh, of course, equitable uh, value chains, meaning that, you know, small farmers and so on have to be become an integral part of value chains. They can't no longer just be, um, you know, um, delivering the sort of commodities and being this anonymous, uh, invisible link in this chain. They are the real heroes that tell the stories. They are the guardians of ecosystems. And of course, um, ecosystem services have to be thought of as an integral part of agriculture, not some sort of pollinator strips along the side of uh, highly uh, sprayed and monocropped fields, you know, that is just this kind of reductionist thinking. Um, John Eichert, the amazing agronomist, uh, US scientist, speaks about sustainability only arising from holes. You know, you can't have deep sustainability in this kind of patchwork of different measures. So when you uh, combine these things, then you actually um, get um, this incredible effect that you have SDG driving qualities both uh, on the uh, on the egocentric uh, mindset. If things that are you know going in the wrong direction through balancing feedback, through corrective measures, are brought into a more uh, you know equilibrium space, and things that are working really well. Uh, you know, are supported through reinforcing feedback. So these SDG drivers can really develop from both sides through both kinds of mindsets. And through the uh, cumulative driving action of these, you know, different leverage points, you get these converging communities of practice, which then lead to the uh, sort of SDG performance as an emerging property, really, you know, SDGs are an emerging property. They develop on the basis of many distributed positive synergies. You know, we've spoken about negative synergies before that are vicious cycles. We're talking here about virtuous cycles, engaging in positive feedback, uh, you know, uh, delivering positive externalities. And that's the sort of uh, equalizing model that I believe is so important uh, that the SDGs finally bring a sort of um, equalizing effect. You know, everybody can actually partake in this. This is not rocket science. This is a very equitable uh, affair. People um, understand common sense. People want to engage in this coherent approach gaining a sense of coherence from this. And so if I may just show this one other model, what I found in organic food systems, they promote actually things like self-determination, this beautiful motivational macro theory, you know, that 
people need to feel a sense of autonomy. They need to feel a sense of um, uh, competence and uh, a sense of social relatedness. The self-determination theory means if these needs are met, people are intrinsically motivated. And when you are intrinsically motivated because these fundamental needs are met, then usually people engage in much more environmentally friendly behavior, which leads to this sort of sense of coherence and the ecological altruism, which is a real thing that people feel a need to be kind to nature. They feel nature as part of their sort of soma body, you know, just as we find our body being the kind of first layer of, uh, you know, feedback when something is misaligned in our uh, mind. And sometimes the body is the first that will, you know, actually come to suffer from that through some disease. So is also the planet, the next layer of this feedback, you know, and it probably goes on like that. So sustainable happiness, these are theories, scientific theories, eco-spirituality, and of course, Maslow's beautiful theory of the hierarchy of needs. His um, pyramid of needs didn't just end with self-actualization. Maslow's pyramid of needs actually ended in self-transcendence in his later model from the 60s. He added this next layer. There is a real need of human beings to develop a sense of self-transcendence. And so I find that these things really go hand in hand. You get the STG performance based on a mindset that has many layers of sort of um, integrative levels, you know, these positive synergies that build and emerge to uh, sort of new macro regimes of consciousness, really. And these two things completely go hand in hand. And sustainable and regenerative uh, agriculture systems are the perfect delivery system for these things. They provide a catalyst in a way. They pave the way, they, they transport the narratives. They inspire folks through the belly from the food and the, um, you know, the actual outcomes that we see in terms of biodiversity uh, through the many sort of distributed positive outcomes. And so to me, it is crystal clear that fastest and best way to induce this uh, transformation that we need is through the food system and regenerative and organic can actually uh, be a powerful catalyst that transport the kinds of social and environmental norms that we need to change not just the technology which is the sort of outer manifestation it's kind of a crutch you know and it's a helpful crutch obviously but it can also do something on the inside. And that's where that whole sufficiency thinking comes in. We need to not only think about efficiency and consistency, but also sufficiency. So that's my wrap. Thanks for letting me unfold this. No, bit. that is perfect. I mean, we're, I'm going to have you wrap some more because it's, um, you know, the, the um, King Ram the ninth of Thailand and, um, he really came up with a, a similar model to the SDGs. It's called this uh, as a sufficiency model as well. And when you talked about um, altruism, the, uh, one of the oldest uh, writers and theorists, philosophers, and, and the, in the food movement around animal liberation is Peter Singer. He's also been on the podcast. I believe he's coming up uh, on on Thursday, so tomorrow uh, is his podcast, but he has a whole a whole website and, and theories and books on effective altruism. So everything that you um, mentioned, everything that you brought up is, it's, it's all reality. And especially there, what you said at the end about um, the fastest way in 2017, uh, Yo Professor Dr. Johan Rockstrom and uh, I believe it was Christiana Figueres or Patricia Espinoza, so the queen of the COP, the Co Conference of the Parties for the United Nations, had the exponential roadmap of the SDGs to reach 
um, all the goals by 2030. Well, what do they mean about exponential? Well, our world is really growing around us exponentially, good, bad, and ugly, I guess uh, we could say. But if you think about it, what you said, the fastest way is really through food and the SDGs because we eat three times a day. We produce food every single day. We process it, whether it's good, bad, or ugly food, where we're, it's our basic battery source. It's our energy source. It's a, uh, it's a life source. And um, the basic need that is also on Maslow's hierarchy needs. So if we combined food with the SDGs, I mean, there you've got a formula for positive exponential growth. I mean, there could be negative exponential growth that is really horrific, you know, whether it's climate change or human suffering or whatever it is. But on the flip side, if we use it in the positive right ways and, and we apply the right systems and the right consciousness, the, the meaning and purpose or why and where do we want to go and how do we get that balance back? Um, what you showed so perfectly, I think that, that you're, you're absolutely spot on. That is the fastest way. And it's also the funnest way. I love to eat. Mm. I love to eat good food and I love to, to grow food. I love to to watch it grow and be part of that biome and part of the, the ecology uh, of, uh, of food and uh, agroecology of, of food, basically, and, and to watch it. There's such a joy to see living systems. And um, uh, it, it's even more joyful. You know, I've uh, in the past, I've heard a lot about ugly fruits and ugly food, you know, and I, I get the most joy about ugly stuff, you know, when it comes out unique and crazy, I was like, that's so cool, you know, that's life. And um, so I really, really appreciate you, you're showing that and you're spot on and, and you also tease quite a bit on uh, what your contribution is. And so that's why I'm so happy that you really made a culmination of uh, menu B is not just about the SDGs, but it's about global food reform and how we shift that paradigm and how we see food and what are the tools and how can we um, really get that food systems that we want to see, you know, the, the local, the resilience, the regenerative, the ones that really are healing our biome and healing us as humanity. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, your contribution really did that. And so I, I thank you for that and, and bringing in uh, a well-rounded piece and very, uh, it's all, uh, I, I don't know, scientific. It's, it's, it's very well-written, you know, and um, I thank you for that. I, I want to talk a, a little bit about... Um, now, now that we've kind of, we've all, we almost went deep right in the beginning. We didn't start out slow. We were supposed to tease the listeners uh, a little bit into this, but we, we've hit them hard and heavy. And I guess that's okay. Humanity's been eat, eating for, you know, 12,000 plus years on an agrarian society, at least. Uh, and uh, as hunters and gatherers, a lot a lot longer than that before mm -hmm. and so it's about time that we we wake up to the realization of, of how vital this is in our world and it's not it it, it it is the most vital thing more so than money and materialistic things or anything else it's what connects us to nature and to our future um you're working on some fabulous things for cities and it's called the City Region Food Systems. Uh, it's a UN existing model that has been tested in over seven cities um, successfully and there are some, some results and some good feedback from those tests. Uh, I'd like you to tell us a little bit more about that and kind of uh, how you see that moving on further, what you're, you're going to be working on possibly in the future and and is that something that also you want to kind of replicate around the world and why mm -hmm. thank you well first uh may i say that i always find it um the most moving thing when you speak with folks um around the world no matter you know where it is really you know to 
uh, an indigenous uh, farmer from India or, um, you know, some um, person that discovered natural farming in, in Haiti um, or in the, in the jungle of, of, um, of the Amazon with indigenous communities, we speak uh, with one tongue when it comes to this. Now, where does this come from? Isn't that the most striking phenomenon that um, there seems to be such a powerful resonance um, with this cognition of, uh, which is really expressed in this uh, systems thinking, which is a mindset in itself. And it's a, the, the best way and the most undogmatic way to actually approach a sense of um, uh, eco-spirituality, shall we say. You know, Capra writes about that. One of the co-authors in your amazing book, Menu B, which will come out soon, he speaks about, you know, once we understand these connections, you know, once we engage in um, this uh, sort of systems thinking and a sustainability mindset, um, we realize that the ecosystem uh, is the most spiritual in its essence, you know, and it's the it's it's such a unifying message. I find, you know, that it is actually an objective truth. There is moral truths, and there are truths of cognition, and people understand these things, and they are deep inside us. I believe we are hardwired for sustainability. Nobody can tell me otherwise. Yes, we are conditioned by stuff and, you know, facades built up. And, you know, we often just um, defend that paradigm, you know, um, you know, uh, just until the anomalies begin to accumulate that, uh, you know, it just can no longer be defended. <laughs> but just the, um, yeah, the, the, the sheer vehemence that many people defend this neoliberal mindset with is really striking, you know? And on the other hand, uh, when you see people, you know, that have been um, touched and, 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 and this drive has been liberated, you know, this, this drive toward uh, self-transcendence and toward uh, cognition and, 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 and this awareness and consciousness. Um, I find it incredible, you know, how unified these insights are. And, you know, Otto Sharma, somebody you well know, I'm Very sure. You, yeah. Uh, he speaks of these, um, you know, he makes the metaphor of the operating systems, you know, and that we are approaching a sort of 4.0 operating system currently still in a sort of outcome centered uh, kind of um, a mindset, but soon uh, we will be uh, thinking more in terms of um, co-creation, you know, nature positive, an ecocentric mindset, food as medicine, businesses having uh, a purpose. You know, these things are uh, the inevitable uh, sort of um, journey that we're on. You know, sometimes I almost would like to uh, um, sort of riff on um, Luther King's uh, famous dictum, uh, the uh, arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice, right? What a thing to say. You could yes. almost say that for sustainability too. You know, I think it is inevitable. Even evolutionary biologists are saying there is no such thing as survival of the fittest. That was good for a bump sticker, but it yeah. was grossly misinterpreted. You know, totally wrong. Exactly. And luckily, you uh, your episode one hundred and forty on the podcast series, but one hundred and thirty nine is. Dr. Fritolf Capra, he's oh. right before you. Oh and, uh, so not only he's he right in the book, we also did a podcast and he talked about many of the things in a much different way as, as he so eloquently does mm -hmm. uh, than you. So I think this is perfect alignment that uh, you, you also refer to him and 
you know, obviously Alto Sharmer um, theory, you and MIT and all his work that he's done over the years and continues to do uh, fabulous work. You're, you're spot on. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I love to uh, love to see that you're, you're, you're bringing that up. I also feel that um, over the years, sustainability has been bastardized in, in many respects. So uh, chemical companies like uh, Bayer and Monsanto are using the word sustainability. Uh, fossil fuel companies are using the word sustainability. They have nothing to do with sustainability. And, um, but I, I think that it's ingrained in us and uh, we, we are making this shift and it's really a way that connects us back re regeneration and connects us back to nature and to our world. And so I love that you, you bring that up. I really do. Absolutely. And we need to get uh, on board with, um, you know, those global players. I mean, from a systems point of view, it is, um, it is uh, indispensable that these large corporate players um, make the necessary shifts in their value chains, you know, uh, the Nestle's of the world, you know, the large uh, discount supermarket chains, uh, Bayer Monsanto launched this carbon initiative, you know, and it's, it's really, um, well, it's, also heartwarming in a way to see, you know, that they are talking about biostimulants, you know, as new products, you know, in their portfolio and enrolling farmers in these registrars, you know, for um, sort of increasing soil organic matter in, in soils. There's some amazing work going on in the U.S. right now with the... Uh, it's always hard for me, and I don't know if you have this feeling as well, so I almost cringe and pull back when, when I hear that. You know, I want those companies to make the transition mm -hmm. and to, to reform and change and, yes. and to better our world. I think it's a, a, every individual's mission to be in selfless service to life and, and to our earth and to actually leave the planet better than we found it, to clean it up and to mm. actually have it be one of regeneration. Um, if we're a business that we actually, you know, do good for the world, we leave it better with more global hectare, with more resources than we found it because we're not just an extractive taker and, and, and a, a abuser um, of this world. And but when I hear, you know, uh, companies like Bayer, Monsanto, or, or someone uh, even like Nestle is uh, recently Nestle, and even through um, Paul Hawkins' new book, Regeneration, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, I'm like Nestle, the, the big plastic, and you know, just didn't give a crap about many things, but now. They realized they were hurting their own farmers, the own people that were they were getting the resources to produce their products from, and they want to they want to heal those relationships and they want to heal those people and they mm -hmm. want to heal those. So right now, that gut feeling is saying, "Okay, I'm gonna trust them. I'm gonna try," but it's hard for me, and I don't know if you have, feel the same way. Oh, absolutely. The thing is, you know, uh, when you look at just how all the large corporations now uh, are hiring, uh, you know, sustainability managers and uh, directors for bioeconomy, circular economy, you know, it, um, it shows you that, you know, after that famous letter by Larry Fink from BlackRock, you know, sort of that your rating will go down if you don't, you know shape up in terms of um you know resilience uh, of your operations and so on it's uh it's on the one hand nice to see uh and i think just that sort of um narrative and the, the sheer mechanism of getting into that space will sort of steer them in that direction but i'd like to also say it took me um you know i'm i'm in my 40s now and it took me uh, a long time to acquire 
the kind of knowledge that I have now. It's hard work. You know how they say that like relationship work and stuff, it, it takes uh, effort and, and so on, you know? And it's the same with these sort of deep sustainability insights. You have to kind of earn them, you know? You have to really, um, you know, uh, wrestle with that and, and rub against uh, other realities and, 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 and enter dialogue and, and, and make these insights for yourself. And I just, um, you know, would caution that, you know, this, this greenwashing is, is always a big risk, you know. But I mean, I trust that there is uh, the kind of pressure that will sort of force these companies to, but on the same uh, token, it's the sustainability um, uh, uh, leaders or, or the, the, the leadership in these uh, corporations that is sort of already much more pronounced than uh, with the general public. You know, they are among the early adopters. You can say businesses are sort of already there. They've agreed on a sustainability mindset. They've agreed on environmental social governments, governance. They've agreed on all these protocols, you know, um, that will foster um, diversity and, 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 and environmental justice in, in their operations and so on. And so that's a really interesting uh, development that's going on. But um, I just would like to remind folks that it takes work, you know, and you have to really wrestle with it in an authentic way or else you just get this sort of lip service and, you know, nobody's really served by that. But what I see in these approaches, um, such as the city region food system model, it's been advanced by the FAO and Ruaf Foundation. It's a beautiful approach to uh, get in on this more territorial approach, you know, to food system uh, sustainability. And it's a, a, a lovely um, mechanism to enable this um, this uh, rural urban nexus and to develop the kinds of governance mechanisms um, that enable the sort of top down and bottom up uh, kind of approach that is necessary not to create some 100% food sovereignty who wants that you know who wants to go without their chocolate let's say in the global north or coffee and things like that you know that'll always be there but I mean the kinds of things that can reasonably, reasonably be uh, produced and farmed in the sort of nearby uh, territory of metropolitan areas without the kinds of trade-offs obviously you don't want to grow you know tomatoes in Vermont in uh, in January when you need tons of artificial lighting and heating and then it indeed would actually be much more climate friendly and effective to ship them in from you know Nicaragua or Florida for that matter but still there are a lot of things you know like if I look at my supermarket zucchinis you know, uh, carrots, tomatoes, uh, cucumbers coming in from, from Almeria, southern Spain right now, really? When, you know, <laughs> we could grow all these things and actually boost the local economy, you know, and create beautiful social entrepreneurship out of regenerative agriculture. And these city region food systems were for the first time really giving a methodology to developing these kinds of food system spaces. And I think there would be a, an amazing platform to launch you know, SDG certificates to really get into the verification game on how uh, equitable supply chains, how sovereignty in the agrobiodiversity, how integration in the environmental services, how transformation in the education, the things I talk about in my leverage point model can really drive change and can be verified through mechanisms, you know, that we have. Uh, through different moderators, participatory guarantee systems, peer reviewed processes, but also technology, obviously, um, to actually create uh, real interventions against the sort of baseline 
scenarios and could um, provide, um, especially uh, metropolitan areas in the global south that are struggling for meaningful foreign direct investments to actually get in on the green economy, get real on the you know, food system uh, narrative and actually um, you know, engage in entire metropolitan areas in these positive synergies. So I'm really excited on working together with the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact folks, with the Global Alliance for Organic Districts, the Asian local governments for organic agriculture. Over 250 municipalities in South Korea and India have declared to go 100% organic in their municipalities. This is some NGO of mayors, can you believe it? The, uh, Asian local governments for organic agriculture. Sri Lanka has now declared to go organic, you know, and carbon. That's amazing. Yeah. And so these kinds of uh, approaches, they need sort of quantification methodologies, they need verification mechanisms. And so I really quite like the work of these, you know, standards such as, you know, global uh, gold standard or Vera folks you have interviewed on your show. I think it's important that um, they also understand the importance of these public-private partnerships. You know how um, you know ag uh, uh, companies, but municipalities and smallholder farmers uh, can uh, develop these kinds of new clean development mechanisms, really. And food hubs are such an important motor for these local food systems. Again, a really good helpful, robust invention of the US. You know, if the US gets uh, serious about stuff, they really go for it. You know, the innovative entrepreneurial spirit of the US is, is really remarkable. You know, the way they've pioneered this community supported agriculture movement around the world and these food hubs now since the last 15 years, since the beginning of the 2000s, these beautiful aggregation hubs, you know, how to actually in a very consequential manner, aggregate food from a geographical radius and just market that food within that region. That is a real game changer, what food hubs can do. They can work with local farmers, they can create regional planning, you know, the food hub does the marketing and the last mile, you know, working with hospitals, all this sort of public procurement, you know, colleges uh, and uh, old folk homes and, you know, actually developing consistent, robust supply chains for local food that individual farmers and gardeners could never stem by themselves. Imagine a, a, a a university cafeteria having to deal with 20 different farmers, the one delivering pumpkins, the other one potatoes, the next one greens. It doesn't work that way. So these food hubs are an important aggregator to make this sort of uh, local supply chain work. So they are real engines for territorial food systems. And I think we have all the parts, you know, to actually develop meaningful localization if we just put it together in robust programs and attach the right indicator frameworks and verification mechanisms to really, you know, move the needle in the, uh, this age of, you know, climate change and finding solutions. This can be a tremendous contribution, I think. It's a huge contribution as creating local uh, economies, uh, local futures, stability, not only community food webs, but all sorts of logistics that's bringing production and manufacturing back where, where the community is. Um, a, a lot when, when I hear city uh, and regional food systems, I get really excited because that's really how most cities and communities formed was originally around food systems. And now, especially Hamburg, most of the food systems have moved way out into the countryside and industrial areas far from the city. So Hamburg gets about 40% of all its produce and vegetables from the Netherlands. And then another 40% from Al Alameria, where you just said in Spain, um, that's not a lot of resilience. That's not a lot of stability. 
Um, they get a lot from the harbor as well, a lot from Turkey and, and, and other places. Because it's a hub and a harbor, it comes from all around the world. Mm -hmm. If something happens to, to the harbor, if something happens to Hamburg, mm -hmm. we've had a couple of floods over the years and, and things where Hamburg is shut down for a little while. Yeah, those people, those people can't continue to bring that in. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, um, there's these food deserts and food scarcity, and, and we lose that sovereignty yeah. that we really want to achieve. And so how through victory gardens or small um, food hubs or, or these markets, you know, we do have luckily some nice uh, uh, food markets uh, where from the farms around Hamburg, bring it in. But really, how do we get back to that? How do we strengthen those food webs? Yeah, exactly. And make it work. And how to also involve, you know, partners in the global south that are dependent on these um, exports. You know, one wouldn't want to uh, stop many of these supply chains, but one has to also safeguard that in those places, um, folks are also experiencing a sense of food sovereignty. You know, I know a friend of uh, mine, uh, she is um, an African uh, activist um, in Uganda, and she has started to work with, you know, hundreds of small uh, holders uh, outside of Kampala, the, the capital of Uganda, um, to aggregate all the uh, produce. And then she talks with the farmers and says, okay, this one here is great for uh, export, but this one here could actually be uh, beautiful for the local markets. And so she inspired a bunch of supermarket chains in Kampala to link with these small holders, which hadn't been the, the case before, you know? And she found an incredible model to both serve the local market and create a diverse uh, food environment for these you know, organic fruits and vegetables. This is an organic project and also an export platform. So I think it's super important to have a solidarity-based approach with you know, communities, agrarian communities in Romania, in Southern Spain, in, in, in many countries of the global South um, to engage in this trade, but it has to be meaningful you know, on both sides. We can't just, um, you know, have farmers uh, producing these sort of, um, you know, boutique crops and they themselves don't actually, you know, they've never tasted what this amazing coffee really is like, you know, and we're enjoying our third wave uh, specialty coffee, you know, it can't be like that, you know. And so that's why these value chains, as complex as they are, they have to be properly understood. And, you know, real ESG-based uh, sort of um, uh, standards, and there are many standards, such as the climate community and biodiversity standards by Vera, have to be applied in these value chains, you know, so that we can enter into meaningful trade. Um, because, you know, nobody wants to go without the good stuff, you know. Yeah, and it is good stuff. <clears throat> Some yeah. of us um, really need to develop a taste bud and understand that that um, there there is some really good stuff out there. Uh, I don't know if you know my full story, but um, when I was a young father, a young a young adult, I um, was was really fat and and kind of overweight and numb oh. towards towards the world. And if you would ask me back then about sustainability or uh, certain things, um, I, I was almost numb because I didn't have that taste for, for all sorts of good food, even though I'd traveled the world and <clears throat> have, have a real great experience through my family in many respects. But I was numb in many respects, just because uh, disconnected from that biome, truly um, how I should have been even though I was farming, even though I was connected with my family and, and those things, there was still a disconnect. Um, and also that longing in some respects that farm life is boring. 
I want to get the heck away from the farm. I want to get to the city where life and, and um, you know, technology and, and all, all these, these fun things are happening and going mm. on. And, and, um, and uh, boy, li living out underneath the stars and connected to the animals and that, that's, uh, boy, that could be a little boring, you know. And a lot of people run into that. And we actually have one of the stories in the book from Teresa Leap, um, who uh, is originally from a German farming community. And she now lives in San Francisco and works for Green Biz um, and as a writer for them and things. But uh, she, she couldn't wait to get off the farm and get into a new lifestyle. She wanted to be surrounded by people and, and the modern societies. But she tells it in a different way as well, because as she got into the cities, and this is kind of where the city regional food systems really comes back into it. She wants to eat organic. She wants to eat fresh fruits and, and vegetables. She wants to start at those community food hubs and the community food webs and the farmer's markets. That's where she wants to get. She wants to buy from Whole Foods and she wants to get things that are, are good, you know, um, for your health. Mm -hmm. She doesn't want to la live the fast food society uh, um, kind of kind of lifestyle, which you see not far away from where she's at in, in San Francisco. From When you go to LA, there's food deserts and a lot of insecurity mm -hmm. around food. And so <clears throat> how do you get those people who you know, I'm sure that a lot of our listeners, I'm sure a lot of the people who will read the book, like, I don't want to become a farmer. I don't want to become an organic agriculture farmer or, you know, I just, I'd like to do that in the city. I've got a job at the bank or I've got a job here, you know, and that's their lifestyle and they can't see this, this future, but they also can't see themselves becoming an urban farmer or kind of having a better connection. And so, Somehow we have to find a balance for, for these, you know, seven, eight billion people on our planet that uh, uh, um, I, I by no means have the feeling that that all of us will become farmers, but I, I do have a feeling that we'll become more connected to our food, which mm -hmm. is the consciousness that you talk about. And I, I, I know you've touched upon it a lot, but I, I would... I'd like to know if you've said all there is to say or your thoughts or feelings on this transformation towards a more consciousness in sustainability and how that connection is established or how it happens. And even for those who don't want to be the farmers who want to live in an urban city and, and, and San Francisco work for Apple or for Google or, or someone else, but still have the, that connection somehow. Exactly. Well, um, in uh, this uh, scientific research project <clears throat> that I've done with these 240 interviews in 11 countries around the globe, we didn't interview just farmers, we interviewed um, food system actors, you know, um, including educators, including consumers, including traders, logistics folks, and farmers. And we found that just by uh, the act of um, participating in this uh, territorial organic food system, which were those 11 cases that we looked at, it provided an entry point for folks uh, to develop this kind of awareness, you know? It's the perfect entry drug, if you will, you know? It's the um, uh, sensitizing uh, you know, a, a sensitizing effect that happens. And there are, of course, many different entry points. You know, people get it through experiencing yoga or, um, I don't know, there's this thing called forest bathing now. <laughs> you know, the most random kinds of um, mindfulness acts uh, can uh, actually trigger this awareness um you know and it's an entry point and one has to be um aware of the feedback that comes to you it's really about developing this exquisite sense for feedback you know um and it starts you know with your body but it also 
starts with your emotional intelligence, you know, that you become aware of your motives, you know, that you just apply this almost radical honesty about your own motives. And don't just, uh, you know, uh, believe in everything you feel, you know. I sometimes say, I can feel literally wrong about something. I know this sounds really harsh. I don't mean to be offensive, but I, I found this for myself. Just because I feel something so strongly doesn't mean that it is true. You know, we put so much emphasis on how we feel. But if, um, you know, the sort of will forces aren't aligned with our reason or our higher sort of self, you know, then we can sort of feel all sorts of things that are kind of meaningless, you know. And so um, I think that um, food systems and the organic food space, never mind if you enter it through the educational pathways or as a consumer or partaking in urban gardening projects um, or any sort of campaigns um, or being part of a co-op, it's just a powerful entry point because the um, organic and regenerative agroecological space, uh, the, this, this narrative is, is, is loaded. It's, it's a loaded paradigm. It means it transports a lot of very, very meaningful narratives and norms, you know, that trigger this kind of um, journey. You know, really, it's it's a journey, you know, and you find that it uh, takes on a trajectory of its own and you just have to allow that, you know, you have to sort of commit to unlearning certain things and become alert to this feedback, you know, and these at first gentle positive feedback loops that build, you know, and then uh, it just becomes a, a beautiful cascade of awareness building. And so I think everybody can do that, you know, I'm just saying that the food system space is one of the more powerful ways to enter into that. I, I love that. I absolutely love it. I have four more questions for you and then then we're done. Um, <clears throat> the hardest question, and I'm sure you um, have heard it before since you've listened to the other podcast. And I usually ask it as uh, it's the burning question, WTF. But for you, I, I, I believe it would be better to phrase it in a different way. And that is, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Hmm. I've just uh, given a seminar with um, some 20 students um, on this. We called it a utopian workshop, you know. Um, just sort of starting with the organic agriculture, regenerative agriculture, and if one were to allow the many synergies that intuitively evolve from that, where would that lead us? What SDGs would be triggered by that if we just allowed it to unfold, literally? Uh, and uh, through this analytical exercise, we found what the food system science has uh, already um, sort of confirmed as an emerging consensus that literally all of the SDGs will be triggered through that. You know, it, there is not one that will not be positively affected by this development. And so I believe that if we uh, would just strengthen these kinds of impulses that are going toward post growth and so on, stabilizing uh, successful. Uh, economies in the in the uh, industrialized nations, you know, and focusing more on the kinds of um, values that build, um, you know, global commons that work for everybody, um, could really take us into uh, a space where we discover a different kind of progress, a progress that may not be as loud, you know, a progress within you know, that is just as powerful. And it will unleash, I think, the kind of entrepreneurial uh, and, and social entrepreneurship um, that, um, you know, that will be fostered if these driving forces are liberated, you know, 
because they will uh, liberate something uh, within us and they will liberate something uh, without in, in the world surrounding us. And so um, I can't wait, you know, to live in this world that becomes ever more aware of these subtle kinds of interconnections, um, you know, and um, I'm not afraid that it would be a sort of overly synchronized world where everybody just sort of like a robot preaches sustainability mantras. No, I believe there is so much diversity in there. There is so much innovation in there that it'll actually, um, you know, lead us to the sort of true potential of us uh, human beings, you know, as we approach this journey of, of transformation and maybe detecting uh, sort of meaning in life, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. I that's... truly agree. Yeah, there, there is a, a lot of meaning de detectable in, in a journey like that and, and exactly what you described. Had we had started in 2015 to really just say, well, we've got the SDGs and let's get going on them, we would have had 15 years. Now we're in a very similar place to you and I are both Americans where, where John F. Kennedy was when he was speaking to Congress. He said, before this decade is out, we have to put men on the moon uh, we've got a similar type of a thing before this decade is out. Um, my hope, dream and desire is that we realize the, the potential, realize the beauty uh, in the sustainable development goals in the Paris Agreement mm -hmm. of achieving that and uh, reaching that and implementing them. And that it's even if we start out kind of not knowing fully why how or understanding it as we get on that journey it's a it's a journey of discovery and hope and and excitement and and i've just seen nothing but super positive results come back whether it's indigenous peoples mm. uh, people in urban settings or farmers who who have uh, changed their business models their lifestyle models to to look at the world in a different way. And so my question to you is, um, can you maybe finish the sentence? And that is before this decade is out, you will, or you would like to see this happen. Hmm. Um, what I wouldn't want is a scenario that Harari describes in his book Homo Deus, um, where this artificial intelligence, you know, will aid us in our cognition. Um, I don't like scenarios where people are exploring Mars as the next uh, uh, habitat for humanity. I would like there to be a more equalizing effect. Uh, and really bringing everybody along because there is no point if only a few cross the finish line, you know, and having some blissful life experience. It only makes sense if we all advance together and cross that finish line together. I absolutely love that. And, and um, that, I mean, that's almost similar to the the answer you gave what does a world that works for everyone look like and um it's very similar to that because um tr it truly is you know what does a world that works for everyone there is this beautiful thing that i want to read before i ask you the last question um and i don't know if you're familiar with fuck minister fuller he wrote in his his book um operating manual for spaceship earth in the inside cover of that book he kind of wrote his why his mission statement his purpose and it's so beautiful because um the book was written written in uh 1969 was the first publication you have to think about you know it was a year before i was born and that he also at that point in time 
wrote this book, you know, Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth, but then put a why and a purpose for humanity in there and said, to make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anyone. And when you said what you said, that just reminded me of that and, and um, you know, uh, we've got such a, a wonderful spaceship Earth and, and a wonderful home. We shouldn't be looking anywhere else. Uh, we should really think about regeneration and what we can do to, to, to do the right thing, to connect and harmonize with, with our planet and our biome and, and our Earth. Because I believe that in every every way that every scenario that you can run out, it just comes out so nice. Exactly. For future generations for all of us, um, uh, uh, even in half-hearted efforts, I've seen some very positive outcomes when when we mm -hmm. interact in in certain great ways with with nature and our biome uh, that really come back nicely. For sure, it's the it's this idea of uh, sustainability as a form of enlightened self-interest. You know, um, the economist Paul Collier uh, wrote about this too. What can save this world is uh, enlightened self-interest and compassion. You know, um, sustainability is really um, the sort of most um, altruistic form of egotism, if you will, because it is actually benefiting ourselves. You know, it makes us smarter. It makes us, you know, more content, happier, and produces the right kinds of outcomes. So to me, that's always been a very nice sort of narrative, you know. <laughs> I love that. And the last question I have for you is, what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Um, I knew you were gonna ask that question. It's such a good one. <clears throat> well, my professional journey started when I was uh, 19 as a conscientious objector on this organic farm. And from then it sort of started out and, um, you know, I um, I wasn't in a space at the time to uh, to necessarily um, appreciate the um, the maturing the um, the time it takes to develop uh, robust insights and to become a good servant leader you know um and i'm still struggling with that you know but i'm learning um more and more that you know just the mindset alone doesn't really help that much you know it's nice to have this holistic mindset but what we need are solutions and is a real sort of uh excellency in the way uh, of um, governance and implementing um, multi-stakeholder dialogue and engaging in compassionate exchanges and um, and truly understanding the other side. You know, this compassion piece is just as important. And uh, you know, I'm I'm learning this now. You know, I'm getting better at this. And I was such a eco warrior. You know, in those early years farming and you know conquering the world through organic farming and biodynamic agriculture and so um you know i really enjoy these later years in my career now where i get to hang out with people like you and and very chilled uh and, and deeply developed personalities that have taught me so much about you know leadership so yeah i wish thank I you Sebastian, thank you so much for mm -hmm. letting us all inside of your ideas. It's been a sheer pleasure. Unbelievable. Your ideas are fabulous. Uh, the, the 
your your two slides that you showed us were unbelievable in the way you described them. I'm so glad to know you, and I really thank you for your time. This is all I have, but it's also your opportunity. If there's anything you didn't get to say or you would like to say as a departing goodbye, this is your chance. No, we're good. I'm I'm super happy and energized after this conversation. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you very much. And we'll see and talk to each other very soon. Definitely. Bye -bye. See you around. Bye.